We're in the book of Ruth, the first chapter, the story of God's plan to bring us from ruin to restoration. The story in the Old Testament historical section, up until this point, really centered on Naomi's life. She and her husband Elimelech went from Bethlehem of the tribe of Judah, 50 miles to the southeastern area away from the Dead Sea to the region of Moab, a place in which God was not honored. Her husband and her two sons passed away in that 10-year span, and her sons married two Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. And as the call, the conviction of God to go back home fell upon Naomi's life, she discussed with her daughters-in-law, uh, I'm convicted of God, I've got to go back, this is what God wants me to do. So you too choose what would God have you do. Orpah kissed her mother goodbye, and Ruth clung to her and gave us last week one of the greatest declarations of faith therein, in which she said, your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Today, they return, she returns, and Ruth go back to Bethlehem. We will take the scripture up in Ruth chapter 1, starting in verse 19, and read through verse 22, reading out of the ESV translation. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? And she said to them, do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. The return home back to Bethlehem should have been enjoyable, but on the path that leads out of ruin to restoration, sometimes you encounter bitterness. That is the issue the Holy Spirit brings up for us to discuss, to look at upon his word. And I'm going to show you two perspectives of bitterness. The third point will be how to move past bitterness. So trudge through the first two points, and let's get to the third. Here's the first perspective of bitterness. It's the pain of bitterness. Naomi and Ruth they begin the trek back to Bethlehem, which is a place of memories. That's where she and Elimelech were married and raised their two boys. Now, when she was in Moab, when people talked about Bethlehem, they said, oh, that's the place of God's favor. That is the place where God is showing up. And as they begin the journey back 50 miles, they think, we have a new chapter of hope. but instead of restoration. Naomi is dealing with bitterness. It's right there in the text. Bethlehem is a buzz because of these two and because of these travelers. It says the whole city is stirred up. And when you say the whole city, that could be misleading because it says in the subject all of the women began to discuss. 
The women congregate because of the two travelers, and they propose this question, is this Naomi? Ten years has passed since she has left Bethlehem. Ten years will do a doozy on a person. The first church I was a staff person at was in 2005. I served there for two years before I moved to seminary. In about 2017, I was at a state convention, Baptist State Convention, and someone came up to me and said, are you Marcus who served as a student pastor at Hillside Baptist Church? Over 10 years had passed. You know what happens in 10 years? A lot. Your physical features change. Sometimes you gain or you lose weight. And what was so odd, she was my next door neighbor. We loved Nancy. And she said, do you remember a Nancy? I'm like, Nancy, you were my next door neighbor for two years. Yes, I remember you. Is this Naomi? Ten years has passed. And we can joke. But the grief of losing a spouse and two sons will have a physical alteration in which Botox cannot fix. The gray, the crow's feet, all of that. Is this Naomi? The problem is the understood what is not said. If this is Naomi, where is Elimelech? That's what they're thinking. Naomi, Elimelech, Malon, Chilion, they all left. And now it's Naomi and this Moabite woman. Where's Elimelech? Where's Malon? Where's Chilion? Naomi doesn't look the same. And when the ladies issue this statement, Naomi responds. So how does she respond? With bitterness. It just sprang up out of the soul of Naomi. Because that's what bitterness does. I'll explain it later. But let me define what bitterness is. It's the feeling of an individual or a behavior of that person in which they're angry, they're hurt, they're resentful because of bad experiences or a sense of unjust treatment. Sometimes... Bitterness is because people cannot forget the bad things that happened in the past. That's both from Oxford and Cambridge definitions. The women didn't know what was going on in Naomi's life. Happened on that path. She responds with bitterness. The women didn't know. So, why do people act bitter? Why are people so resentful outwardly? Why are people so self-loathing inwardly? It's bitterness. Years ago, we got advice from people that said, you should buy some chickens. It'll be a lot of fun. <laughs> and they said, get more than what you think you need because some will certainly die. That was a lie. We bought six thinking we're going to keep two. <laughs> so we had chickens. We didn't know what we were doing. And we let them out to run free during the day. We, we kept them in an enclosure in the evenings. And our chickens would go into other people's yards. Now, one house was unoccupied, so we didn't care. It actually cleaned up their yard. And there was an older lady that lived next to us. The chickens would just hop the fence because we didn't know how to take care of them. We didn't know to clip the, the flight feathers. And so she, in this backyard she never used, never mowed, never raked, our chickens reigned supreme. One evening, I get a knock on my door, and it's the sheriff's department. Now, it's not uncommon for pastors to interact with Law enforcement, that happens a lot. Uh, I'll get a call, uh, hey, do you know this person? Do you know this family? Can you help us? 
One time they asked our church, they called me and said, do you have footage from your church, security cameras? Because we had an incident and we think you might have caught it. Actually, that happened there and it happened here. And so it's not uncommon for us to talk to law enforcement. And so I opened the door, a guy I've known for years, he wouldn't look me in the eye. He's looking down, <laughs> looking around. I was like, what are you doing? Hey, man, how are you? He said, do you know I'm here? Not even looking at me. I said, is it because of the chickens? <laughs> yes. I said, I'll handle it. He said, that's all I need to hear. And he just walked away, got in his patrol car, and he left. They called the cops on us. I say, they, she. Now, this lady was older, had no one in her house with her. Uh, we lived on a circle drive, and so my wife would be pushing a stroller. Our two older kids would be on bikes, and we would walk to make them tired so they'd fall asleep at night. And every time we walked past this lady, we'd wave and say, good evening, good morning, how are you? And she never changed her demeanor, arms crossed, and just glared at us. I'm like, how do you not wave at a six-year-old kid or a four-year-old kid? She's the one that called the cops on us. And we're going to show her. Every time we walk by that house, we waved bigger. We greeted louder. And still she remained unmoved. As time passed, so did she. You know what she passed away of? Natural causes, but for this illustration, she died of bitterness. She was bitter. And she took it out on us. She called the cops on a pastor's family. She was bitter. And it was not just an outward flow. There was something in her that made her angry, resentful, self-loathing. Something happened in her life that caused bitterness to spring forth. It's the same issue with Job. There's a, a fascinating parallel between the story of Ruth and the story of Job. A lot of parallel. But in Job 23, verse 2, he said, Today also my complaint is bitter. My hand is heavy on account of my groaning. He was bitter because he lost his family, he lost his belongings, and he didn't know why. And because of that, he said, listen, I am bitter. This is natural. And I believe when Naomi was moving back to Bethlehem, she was carrying her baggage of bitterness. She didn't know it, but she was lugging that stuff around. And at just the opportune moment, bitterness came forth like a geyser. Everything is different now. So she brought bitterness. Bitterness, I believe, is connected with suffering, which we talked a lot about in 1 Peter. And sometimes when a person is bitter, they feel like they're all on their own. Like, why am I going through this? No one else has this. They are experiencing what I'm experiencing. Now, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 10, the heart knows its own bitterness and no stranger shares its joy bitterness is painful to yourself it makes you feel isolated but bitterness also goes out to other people when a person is bitter it affects outsiders and others it hurts your relationship and realistically it hurts your relationship with God that is the pain of bitterness Get back in God's word, first, excuse me, Ruth chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. She said to them, do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, 
For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? The first perspective is the pain of bitterness. The second perspective is the struggle. The struggle with bitterness, it's evident in the way Naomi words things. Naomi is dealing with bitterness. She lost her husband. She lost her sons. She spent 10 years in a place she didn't want to be. And when the women began to talk to her back in Bethlehem, it just popped up. You see, bitterness is revealed in two ways. The first is your identity. The second is your theology. So the identity, the identity within bitterness, she's questioning who she is. She told the ladies, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara. Now, Naomi in the Hebrew means delightful or pleasant. Almost can be used as a greeting, exchanging pleasantries. Is that Naomi? And she said, don't call me that. From now on, call me Mara, which in the Hebrew text literally means bitter. So she's saying, don't call me pleasant. Don't call me delightful. Call me bitter. Refer to me as Mara. Why is that? Because she says the Almighty, Shaddai, has dealt with me bitterly. Good grief, Naomi. Where did all this come from? I believe it's a historical reference. I believe she is referencing Exodus chapter 15, verses 22 through 25. As Moses led the people of Israel back to the promised land, it says that in verse 22 and following, then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea. They went to the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. But when they came to Marah, which is the same word, just adding an H on the end, They could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. Therefore, it was called Marah. And the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a log. He threw it in the water, and the water became sweet. There the Lord made for them a statute and a rule, and there he tested them. I think she's making an an historical reference But she is also saying, here is my identity in bitterness. This is who I am now. This has overcome me. I'm struggling with identity. I used to be delightful, but now I'm bitter. That's what happens in bitterness. You struggle with who you are. Not only that, you struggle with who God is. It's not only identity, but it's theology. It's the the question of why. Why? God, why? Why did I go to Moab with my family and I come back with none of them? She says, I went to Moab full, meaning blessed, and I came back empty or ruined. You say, how is this a struggle and theological? Well, she says in verse 13, The Lord did this. Before the reading of this text, uh, previous readings, Ruth chapter 1, verse 13, speaking to the girls, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then in verse 24, Verse 21, she says, The Lord, the covenant God of Israel, Yahweh, has testified against me. Then she says, The Almighty, should I, brings calamity upon me. Herein is the struggle with bitterness, asking God why. It's the struggle to understand God and come into grips with hardship. And if we're being transparent, all of us have wrestled with this or we will wrestle with this. 
Like, God, why did you let me go through this? Why am I dealing with this? God, why am I so bitter? If you're such a loving God, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, why am I facing this if I'm following after you? All believers will deal with theology and the struggle with bitterness. Go back to Job chapter 27, verse 2. As God lives, who has taken away my right, and the Almighty, who has made my soul bitter. All great men and women of God are going to struggle with bitterness. Maybe for a short duration, maybe for a season, it's going to pop up. It's a biblical pattern. Moses dealt with it. Job dealt with it. Joshua dealt with it. Elijah. (laughs) Elijah. He said, Lord, they have killed all the prophets. I'm the last one in Israel. Bitterness. If we're transparent, we all deal with bitterness. Why this happened to me, God? Why am I hurting like I'm hurting? No one else is hurting like this. And Naomi is honest. She says, I'm torn. I know God is for me. But right now, it feels like he's against me. That's what happens when you get bitter. Those are two perspectives of bitterness. But I want to get back to chapter 1 of Ruth because I really want to get you to point 3, moving past bitterness. Verses 21 and 22. I went away full. And the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me? The Almighty has brought calamity upon me. Verse 22. So Naomi returned. And Ruth, the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab, And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. Point number three, here is the application. Here is the action step, if you will. It's moving past bitterness. This is not we get all the answers. There will be some questions in life you will not have an answer to until you stand before our king in heaven. The secret things, Deuteronomy 29, verse 29 says, the secret things belong to the Lord. But in the text, verses four, excuse me, 19 through 22, there's a lot of movement, physical movement, emotional movement. It's all about movement. I want you to see the movement. It says we went away, but now we came back. We left, now we returned. We were in Moab, now we're back in Bethlehem. So when they arrived in Bethlehem, they're dealing with bitterness. At least Naomi is. So I want you to think of bitterness as a location. So we understand it with the movement in mind. It's somewhere or something you have to move past. So in a sense, it's like a pit stop on your journey. So on the path to restoration, there is the pit stop of bitterness that you have to travel through and move past. You can't stay there. So how? How can you do that? Let me give you just a few ways to move past bitterness. Just three ways. Remember God's calling on your life. Sometimes that's the only thing you got. Particularly in dealing with suffering or bitterness, you've got to remember God's calling on your life. Naomi remembered that God convicted her to go back to Bethlehem. Man, she felt the conviction in her soul. I've got to go back. That's God's calling on my life. I've got to go. I've got to keep going. But not only that, the second way to move past, you've got to find the root of bitterness. What is the cause of your bitterness? 
Pastor Jeremy read the text for us just a little while ago, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. The writer of Hebrews says, See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. Find the root. You say, Pastor, when I find the root, what should I do with it? You should kill the root. My wife and I just cleared out some brush on our property. We, we did that months ago. Trimmed the vegetation back. You know what we left? Mm-hmm. The roots. And so we had to use instruments of destruction on said roots. We thought, surely these roots are dead. No, they're bringing forth more fruit. So the roots of bitterness in your life, you should dig, chop, burn, kill. When you find the root of bitterness in your soul, you've got to purge it. Because if you don't, bitterness remains. Remember God's calling. Find that root of bitterness. And then the third way, don't let the fruit of bitterness grow. So in bitterness, it's roots and fruits. The writer of Hebrews is referencing Deuteronomy chapter 29, that God the Holy Spirit gave to the people of Israel on their way to the promised land. A slight variation from where the writer of Hebrews went with it, but it's beneficial for us in the topic of bitterness. Verse 18, it says this, Beware, lest there be among you a man or a woman or a clan or a tribe whose heart is turning away today from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of those nations. Beware, lest there be among you a root bearing poisonous and bitter fruit. Don't let the fruit of bitterness grow. The scripture, oddly enough, makes a connection in Hebrews and also Deuteronomy that there is a correlation between bitterness and drifting away from God. When people are bitter, they make bad decisions or they begin to drift and do something they would never do on their own. There's a connection there. I want you to move past bitterness. The idea of movement in the location, move past it, keep going. Now, there is the three ways to handle it, and that's your part. Three ways you can deal with bitterness, but let me talk to you about God's role in you moving past bitterness. So what will God do? Thank you for asking. God is going to exercise his power over creation, and he is going to be involved in your life. The technical term for that is providence, meaning all the things under his authority, he is going to orchestrate for his good and ultimately for your good. And he is about to do this for Naomi. She says, I went away full, but now I'm back empty. And God says, Naomi, I wish you could see it from my perspective. I know you're hurting now, but in a short time from now, you're going to be shouting for joy. And in the history of faith, Naomi, if you could see what I'm about to do with your family. It's just a coincidence, they say, that she showed back up at just the right place at just the right time for God's favor to be displayed. I can tell you, I don't believe in coincidence in spiritual matters. That is the unseen God moving all the events and happenings and even the seasons to his whim in which he is loving Naomi, he is loving Ruth, and he promises to take care of them. And he says, you have got to keep moving, particularly past bitterness, because I'm about to do something.
and you're going to be a part of it. Man, in the, in the history of salvation, this story is paramount. God's going to work it all out. And Naomi, with God's help, will move past bitterness. She's going to pluck, she's going to purge the root. She's going to chop it so no more fruit can grow. Moving past bitterness, that's the only way to get to restoration. And I would ask you today, how many of you are bitter? How many of you have a a root of bitterness? How about a sliver, a small a small plant. You say, well, it's not a big deal. It's something little. But your mind drifts back to it. You can't help but think of why. You're struggling with it. You're struggling about yourself. You're struggling with God. So here's what I say to you. Keep moving. Keep serving God. Keep worshiping God. Even though you don't feel like it. Just show up and praise him. You're going to be tired anyway. So come and worship the Lord. Maybe today... You're bitter because you don't know God. And you're thinking, how can I handle my problem of sin? How can I save myself? Therein is the problem. You can't save yourself. But there is a holy God, a covenant God of Israel, that if you believe in your heart that he freed you from the the clutches of death, the weight of sin, if you believe in him, that he died on the cross, that he rose again on the third day. His name is Jesus. If you believe in Jesus, you'll be saved. You'll be freed. Now, even after your salvation, you will still encounter bitterness. You'll be bitter with your spouse, bitter with your boss, bitter with the circumstances of life, bitter with your sports teams. You're still going to deal with bitterness, but you don't do it by yourself. You do it with God. You do it based upon the power of his spirit, evidenced in the word. Move past bitterness. If there's other decisions you need to make, if there's something you need to pray, in just a moment, I'll be down front to pray with you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the story of Naomi and Ruth. Father, it's not an easy topic to talk about being bitter. But, Lord, as we we see in her life, we have the benefit of knowing the full scope of her story. And, Father, I believe we look at our lives as an episode and not as a a full look. So, Father, may we change the way we look at our life. May we see it as you see it. Lord, as she deals with bitterness, Lord, I know there are some of us dealing with bitterness. And Father, I pray today that many would find freedom, that many would find a release from bitterness. Father, you, you talk about it as poison. The longer we are bitter, the longer we poison ourselves. So Father, I pray that we'd find remedy in Christ today. Father, we may not have all the answers, but we have you. So, Father, may we seek you in a day you may be found. Lord, if someone today has never trusted in Christ, I pray they would repent of their sin, they place their faith upon the Lord Jesus, and be made new. Lord, for those who need to take steps of obedience with baptism or membership, Lord, I pray you'd impress that upon them. Father, based upon your word and I believe the leading of your spirit for those dealing with bitterness Father may they chop out the root may they throw away the fruit and Father in their bitterness would you meet them now will they have a breakthrough today Father you do not desire for us to be bitter you desire for us to be restored walking in coordination with you So, Father, do a great work in our hearts. We ask all of this in Jesus' name.
Amen.